Pack your full body swimsuits, everybody. We're headed to Coney Island for the summer of 1911. We'll be hitting the beach with a young heiress, Peggy Battenberg. Peggy falls in love and stumbles upon the mystery of a strangler who's leaving young women dead under the boardwalk. We'll punch your ticket for a place called Dreamland next. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. In this episode, our time machine travels back a century to visit America's Playground, Coney Island, Brooklyn. We'll ride the Wonder Wheel sail into a tunnel of love called Hell Gate, and guzzle Coca-Cola for the first time, using it to wash down one of those iconic Coney Island hot dogs. It'll be like a scene out of a Gilded Age beach movie, until the corpses start washing ashore. These are all new experiences for our pampered protagonist, Margaret Peggy Battenberg. She's the 20-year-old heiress to one of the richest families from the age of robber barons. And families like that were so powerful, they could even get away with murder. Our guide on this journey is writer, editor, and lover of words, Nancy Bilyeu. She brings us Dreamland. Dreamland is novel number five for Nancy. It follows The Crown, The Blue, The Chalice, and The Tapestry. She also published a novella, the ghost of Madison Avenue. Her family tree traces back to a seed planted on Gotham shores in 1665, when French Huguenot Pierre Bellou put down roots in what was then New Amsterdam. Today, the stone house Pierre built on Staten Island stands as the third oldest in the Empire State. For more on our guest, visit nancybillieu.com Follow her on Twitter and Instagram at the handle TudorScribe or toss her a like at Facebook.com slash Nancy Bilyeu Author. That last name is spelled B-I-L-Y-E-A-U. Okay, now that we've purchased our tickets for the Wonder Wheel, let's join Nancy Bilyeu and hop a train to Dreamland. I'm delighted to be sitting down with Nancy Bilyeu, author of Dreamland. Thank you for making the time to chat with the History Author Show, Nancy. I am so happy to be here to talk to you and meet you. This is exciting. Well, we jumped through a lot of hoops, and I appreciate your flexibility, because <laughs> originally this was going to be a live meet the author at the Closter Library right. in Closter, New Jersey, but we decided to call an audible because of people's current concerns about coronavirus spread. And do it here. And you were so game. And I appreciate that. I appreciate oh. that you got on the subway, too, because it yes. makes us think about <laughs> when the subway was around. That's one of the things that was the same, right? Right. And back in those days as today, I know they say if you lay the subway map over the old subway map, how similar it is. The L trains are gone, but it's something that links us literally to Coney Island from this area of Midtown. And it's something that makes me feel like, oh, I see those little tiles, for instance, Astor Place, it's beavers. And yes, it, that's yes. romantic. It's fun. Oh, it is. It was startling to me to find out how old the subways really are and how much Coney Island and Manhattan Beach, which is next to it and is 
also in the book, depended on trains. Without them, there wouldn't have been all that action. There's no way to get there as easy or as nice in that Gilded Age splendor where you could have a Pullman car, for instance, that's where your character, the Battenbergs, yes. where Peggy decides to bring her little brother, which <laughs> right. is a great relationship, by the oh, way. I yeah. like that. You know, she's you. 20, right? And he's yes. just 15. Yes. And there's many of those layered relationships. She also has a sister. Mm-hmm. So she goes with him and she says, let me take you out. Let me, let's go by train. And they have to convince their mother and convince everybody to let them do this because, heaven forbid, a, a woman of 20 in 1911 goes and does whatever she wants on her own. Right. But she gets him to go. And I just thought that's a great way to start the book because she's trying to embrace her adulthood and strike out on her own. She doesn't want to be on this trip to Manhattan Beach or to the Oriental Hotel or to Coney Island. She doesn't want to go anywhere out there. She doesn't know much because she's very sheltered. And yet she's trying to help him. She cares about him. It's enough to bring him out there and watch out for him. And then we, of course, worry about him a little bit. And we think, well, what's going to what's going to go on with him? We feel her protectiveness. And that's something that I loved in Dreamland because she has that naivete. She's very provincial, maybe you'd even say, even though she's so wealthy. And yet you never feel like, oh, I imagine that's hard for an author because it's easy to look back at people that have different times in their morals and different ways they look at things and often different language they use and say, well, this this person, I just don't care. It's the idiot in the attic thing, right? <laughs> Where you might not care about this socialite because she's so long ago, she's so far removed from us. And yet you built her as somebody that we really like. So Tell us how you go about that. How do you avoid having it, or not how do you avoid, but how do you build her into somebody who's really likable and relatable, even though she lived 110 years ago? And, and here I go. She didn't live at all, right? She's fake. <laughs> but, <laughs> she's fictional. But here, to me, she feels like she's so alive. Well, she's based on people who I read about at the time, and also a little bit based on people who I have met, and then people from books nonfiction, fiction, all kinds. You know, my characters come from, they have little bits that come from all sorts of of places. But, you know, when you're talking about her and her brother, I think it's important, you know, when you're writing a book, it's very easy to have this person live in your mind and you just think they have these qualities, but it's really important that you have to show the qualities. And so I wanted to show that she doesn't really get along with her mother. She isn't fulfilled as a Gilded Age heiress. She's restless and rebellious, but she does care about the people in her family. She struggles with how to help them when they pressure her. Does she pull back? Does she go forward? And I really wanted to show that she does have, for lack of a better word, a goodness in her. The last thing you want to do is just say, Peggy was a good person. (laughs) You have to sort of figure out how you can show it. You know, in one way I wanted to show it was how that relationship with her brother and sister go up and down throughout the whole book. And the sister, that relationship changes radically. You know, I think about my relationship with my own sister a lot. And I think that that's something that sibling relationships and and, and how you get along with your cousins and so forth, I think that's a big part of people's lives. And it doesn't always have a place in a mystery. So it was important to me to get that in there. And they seems so much more relatable then and also likable. I was talking about losing the suspension of disbelief and losing the affection for the characters because you say, here she's forgiving. Here she's always saying, well, you're still my sister. You're still my brother. And so we don't feel as if here's someone who doesn't like them. And for me, anyway, I have two older brothers. I have a pretty big family. And you're always going to have ups and downs and falling out with somebody at some point. And so I felt with with that one, you read it, even if you don't think of it consciously, I'm only thinking of it now, mm-hmm. you feel like, well, that's the kind of person I'd like to be. Or when I make a mistake, I would like other people <laughs> to forgive me like that. And so it's Oh, that's it, interesting. Yeah. It it just made me see her as a character as I'm seeing you build it because I read it knowing I'm going to speak to you, right? So mm-hmm. I'm looking mm-hmm. for those, I always describe them as pencil marks. Oh. You know, painters paint a, oh, I like that. Paint a portrait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yours. You can use it. <laughs> when they paint a portrait, they draw the pencil sketch first, right? And then they paint over it, and then you don't see those yes. anymore. Like when you watch the Muppets, you're looking for the piece of the guy's hand when you were little, if you were me, right? And <laughs> right. How's he doing no, that? No, I know what you mean. Yeah, what part of that is Big Bird, right? What part of his, how does he do the mouth and move mm-hmm. the handle? Mm-hmm. I always look for that. And for this, it crossed that 
magical line for me where it was you telling me a story that you experienced because you speak in Peggy's voice. It's right. the first person, right? right? So it, it it became very quickly her telling me a story instead of an author writing somebody telling me a story. Oh, good. <laughs> good job. <laughs> yes, good. Let's back up a little bit sure. because you talked about your family now, but your family history dates back a long way and it influences your passion for historical fiction. Since my wife's a genealogist and she traces her tree all the way back, I'm always fascinated by this. I've looked at your bio and it tells me that you are a descendant of Pierre Bilou, who arrived on the shores of New York City, then Dutch New Amsterdam, 360 years ago. Now in Dreamland, this main character that we spoke mm -hmm. about, Peggy Batternberg, she feels a heavy burden of her family name. So how did climbing into your family tree, which you've done a while ago now, before you wrote this book, you've written four other books already, mm -hmm. right? And a novella. So how did that experience over your life help you understand how Peggy would feel just having this name dropped on her? Well, I didn't even know about Pierre Billiou's importance till I was in my 20s because the family has been in... America, wasn't even the United States then, so long and dispersed so much that it wasn't until about, I don't know, within the last generation that due to Ancestry.com and the internet, a lot of the, the bilious, and there's like five different spellings of that original name, but we're all connected. Some of us have found each other. And what happened was, I mean, my father was born in Tennessee. And so I just thought that it was a Southern family. And what I found out through all of the research is that Pierre Billiou built the third oldest house in New York State. It's still there. It's a stone house on Staten Island. And then his children sort of dispersed. <laughs> and some went to uh, Kentucky and then Tennessee. And then um, my grandfather came up to Michigan, where I was born, in the Depression to get work on the Ford Motor Line. So, it, And then I ended up going to New York because I became a magazine editor. And so it's kind of like this really weird circular journey of people migrating around for different reasons. I mean, Pierre came to here for religious reasons. He was a Protestant fleeing some persecution at the time from Catholic France. And he wanted to practice his fervent Protestant faith as a lot of the founder, you know, the pilgrims and so forth, the very early settlers did. And you know, so, but we all move, and then, you know, I have this grandfather, and they were very, very poor in Tennessee, I mean, practically starving in the Depression, and so he made this big move up to Michigan, the industrial, you know, salvation of a lot of people at the time, and Detroit was a fantastic place in the 20s and 30s. A boom town. Yes, and then I end up going to New York, where none of my family had been that I know of, to be an editor and writer. There's sort of a beacon, sort of a siren call, if you will, to go to <laughs> yeah. New York. And and then I find out that that's where we started. So it was really interesting. And I did a lot of research into the uh, Huguenot importance in America and the settlers. Everybody from Paul Revere, I mean, there's a lot of Huguenot prominence. New Paltz has a restored Huguenot village up there. Uh, New Rochelle has a, a see, French name. Different parts of America, but, you know, it's not as known as the English, because the English came in and basically kicked out <laughs> the Dutch at the French and renamed New Amsterdam New York City. And, you know, they became the nationality everybody associates with the founding of that part of the, of the country. But um, there were little things I found out about in my research. Some of them were great. Some of them were weird and startling to me. For instance, he had a, a wife and at least five children and one of his sons was born on the boat coming over the Saint Jean de Baptiste, and that's my I'm descended from that person born on the boat. But his wife died when he was in his late fifties, and he signed a marriage contract with a second wife much younger than him on the day that his first wife died. And so that's a much different huh. <laughs> way to go about things than we can deal with now. But you know, I don't I can't really judge. I know that you needed to move along. <laughs> in those days, yeah. you really needed you help. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and when I hear things about how he was very good at pacifying Staten Island, that he was one of the first people to uh, uh, go out there who was uh, from Europe, 
I wonder, well, you know, what does that entail? You know, so, yeah. you know, to the natives who were already there, living there for centuries. So, you know, it's interesting. You find out a lot of things. You feel very proud and excited. And, you know, when you hit the Ancestry.com trees and, you know, I found out there's an influencer on Instagram named Jason Billu, who I must be related to, and he's very <laughs> big. But then there's also the other parts of being a colonial person in another century and trying to understand. So I think that's a lot of what I try to do, bring it to my fiction, is I write historical fiction. And I do try to get into the heads of the people of how they lived then and not be too anachronistic and judge. Although, you know, sometimes you do. I mean, you just have all sorts of thoughts about people in the past. And when they're related to you, then you really wonder. You know, <laughs> like, like, do I have some of these qualities in me? So this oh, was God. all percolating while you were yes. like, designing Peggy. You know, yeah, like. it was. And her story is uh, much different than mine in that um, she's actually based on, loosely based on the Guggenheim family, and Peggy Guggenheim. And I did study the Guggenheims as well as other families like them. Robert Barons, as they're called, that came into New York around the turn of the century, late 19th century, who made astronomical fortunes, often in one or two generations. Peggy Guggenheim's grandfather came from Switzerland, and he was a peddler. And he just made some money, not a huge amount, but some, and decided to just put some on this mine in Colorado, <laughs> silver mine, turned out to be the mine. And before you know it, he's making a lot of money. And then before you really know it, he's one of the richest men in America. And so now you have the Guggenheim Museum and you have all of these distinguished people. I think that what I thought about when I was studying the Rockefellers, I read a lot about the Rockefellers and the Guggenheims and the Vanderbilts, although they came earlier. You think about luck with a lot of these people, just being totally at the right place at the right time. And then that one thing will differentiate them from everyone else who may come to the country or already be here who works really hard and does not. Yeah, they never get the break. No. So it's very, um, it's almost chilling to think, you know. Yeah, if he hadn't a... said yes to that mine, you know, it's almost like if a butterfly flies its wings, yeah. you know, across the planet. Or he just had a cold that day. Yeah. Then if he go. hadn't invested in that one mine, so much would be different, you yeah. know, in our business and our cultural lives. So it's it's interesting to think about that. And, and also to think about to be an heiress at that time, to be sort of an enlightened person, what kind of guilt would you feel like what have I done to deserve all of this luxury you know I think about that you know when I think about wealthy people um if it's inherited like how how do they handle that to have so much so easily when perhaps they haven't done anything yet at all yeah and she has that feeling about her of knowledge and sometimes that can be a burden sometimes I look at people and I say I don't mean it insultingly or I don't mean it as something, a comment on their mental health or ability. I don't mean I'm smarter or better, but I say to be happy with such simple things. Mm. Like I, I think I'm pretty simple. Like I don't, I don't need something piled on my food. I don't, I don't need a fast sports car. Mm -hmm. I think I'm too old for it now. Anyway, I know what everybody <laughs> would be. Too old. I know what everyone, <laughs> I know what everyone would be saying if I went buying a nice fast convertible at, uh, you know, <laughs> once you hit 50, you're, you're forget about it. guys. you know, so, <laughs> so here I am worrying about what people think, but don't expect the world with her. Here she is working in the bookstore. She's reading the books, and it's not mm -hmm. something you were expected to do. There's a scene in the book. She goes over, and she's looking at these maps of her uncles and the newspapers and stuff, and he walks in, and she can tell that he doesn't like the fact that she's actually trying to learn something about the business because you just wouldn't do that. No. And so that makes a great conflict for the character. It makes us root for her, which I guess is something I'm, I'm a little bit uh, dwelling on because you do it so well. And you say, well – okay, we all have that thing. I mean, here I'm reflecting on myself here, I think two or three times already, and what I've looked at Peggy and what I've thought about myself and identified. And I'm asking you, hey, how did your family introduce? Mm -hmm. And you're explaining it to me. I think that's what great fiction does. It's not just a great story and a great mystery, but I got all that from it. And as I mentioned to you before, I had to stop or I didn't have to stop. I did stop <laughs> three quarters of the way through. That's my rule because I don't want to ever risk giving away since we were going to do this oh, live. Right. Yeah, we were going right? to do this interview live. I didn't want to risk saying what happens at the end of the mystery. So I had to have my wife hide the book, hide Dreamland away from me. So I <laughs> wouldn't read it to the end, give away the end. Then you put it in a setting like Coney Island, still such a romantic 
name still brings to mind yes. so many romantic things. We can all see the wheel. We all see those great backdrops that are there with the Wonder Wheel, the Cyclone, which is later than this, yes. right? They didn't have a Cyclone yet. There was a roller coaster named the Cyclone in Palisades Park, New Jersey. There was a park there, and that was the that was the first Cyclone. And so that's where the name comes from. They brought it over there. Talk about your inspiration. When did you decide that, hey, maybe I want to set a book here, and your mind started churning out those wonderful little fiction pellets that become a book? Right. <laughs> well, I didn't really feel drawn to Coney Island for a long time. I went. I took my own children there. My husband and I took the kids there. My son likes the rougher rides, and yet he doesn't want to be alone. And my husband and daughter refuse. So I would go with the, him on these rides and, you know, afterward be like, oh, I have to sit down. But we had a pretty good day. I actually found it more interesting to go down the beach to this uh, uh, restaurant, Tatiana's, and have a Russian meal. I really love that. But so what happened, what the inspiration for this putting it in Coney Island was, I'm a magazine writer. And I had an assignment from a history website, find a 4th of July history New York story to write about. I thought, well, there's that hot dog eating contest that a lot of people <laughs> are really appalled by. But it also has ESPN trucks showing it live. It's a big deal. And so I thought, I wonder how old it is. I thought maybe I'll get lucky and it goes back to the 40s. And so I started to research it and it goes back to 1916. And to uh, Nathan, uh, who became Nathan's Hot Dogs, and the men who fled from the Austro-Hungarian Empire as World War I was breaking out to get to the United States, and they became people like Nathan's. And in fact, what I find ironic with a hot dog eating contest that <laughs> makes people sick because they stuff themselves <laughs> is the actual Nathan. I watched a documentary on him and read a, a book, and he almost starved to death. And he was wow. like 10, 11, 12 in Poland before he could get over here. So I found that very interesting. But so anyway, what happened was I started with the hot dog eating contest. And then I found out 1916. And I thought, well, I wonder what Coney Island was like in 1916. And that was the rabbit hole of all time. Because <laughs> once I started to find out how magical and fantastical and crazy and boisterous and at times almost criminal, and yet romantic. It was all those things at once. I put the book in um, 1911, and I'd say that 1900 to 1911 is the heyday of Coney Island. You had Juno Park, Steeplechase, and Dreamland, and they're all competing. It's not like when we go to an amusement park now. You're going to one place. You're going to Six Flags or Dorney Park. Yes, yeah, yeah, and it's one place owned by one company or one human and you went to Coney Island and there were all these ferociously competitive parks fighting for your nickel and what I found really beautiful I found some video of Dreamland and Juno Park at night and I actually start the novel with that because I just really got to me the thought of just the like a million lights at night spelling out Dreamland you know supposedly when people would come immigrating to New York to Ellis Island, they would see this on their boats if they're coming in at night, or if it was during the daytime, they, they could see coming in some of the, the outline of the park, and it was, I'm sure, it made quite an impression. Electric lights, still probably yeah. new to all Very new. many of them. Very new. There. And, you know, a lot of it is a carnival and a circus and a rides, and there's a lot of roots in burlesque and in world fairs, which were very big then. A lot of Coney Island, early Coney Island was based on the Chicago World's Fair because it was such a success. But then what I found was that there were these very luxury, beautiful Edwardian or really Victorian hotels on the water in Brooklyn, less than a mile from Coney Island. But those were two different worlds, totally separate. And in fact, they had literally had Pinkerton guards working the perimeter of, of yeah, the nicest hotels. They to come yeah, in and because they didn't want, you know, they wanted to protect. Quote unquote. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the, what they were doing over there was totally different from the uh, happy hordes uh, rushing out to Coney Island to have a great time. You know, they were playing croquet and tennis and going to the horse races and wearing bathing suits that covered almost every part of their body <laughs> to go out <laughs> into the water and having this very totally different summer 
<laughs> and so what I wanted to do then was I thought I would like to make these two worlds collide. So I came up with Coney Island first, and then I tried to come up with a person who could make it collide. And so I thought about an heiress from a, for lack of a better term, new money family, you know, who's out there for various reasons and finds her way to Coney Island, to Dreamland, and meets all sorts of people, you know, from people who work there or people, you know, an artist who shows work there, working in shops, dancers, because it was very much of a theatrical aspect out there too. So her whole perspective, her whole world is opened up by escaping from, you know, very family summer stifling to her. And of course, it's also in a heat wave. <laughs> so it's yeah, literally it was a hot summer. It was a real, that was a real heat wave. And I, I got details from reading newspapers of the time. Ah, oh, those newspapers are great, aren't oh. they? Oh. To love, talk about a rabbit oh, hole. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's a rabbit hole, too. Oh. Go down there. Oh, newspapers.com is great. I, it is. Even though the search engine is not so great, if anyone's listening, make it better. Because, yeah. But uh, it's still, it, that just makes it more fun in some ways if you have the time to spend looking and reading. And the way that they wrote, because you talked about capturing your nickel, they wanted to capture your penny those newspapers had to be really well written as an editor i'm sure you appreciated reading that and looking at it and saying wow this person really knew how to write a lead <laughs> yes the writing was good and i paid for my enhanced subscription to the new york times to their way back and i could actually read the whole new york times from 1911 certain days and you know i didn't you know i find that i can't go too far in that because I have to give myself space for imagination and character, and I don't want to feel too tense, you know, that like, oh, okay, I have to do this, I have to do that. It's hard. It is. It's yeah, a balance. Cause you gotta be, I was just going to use the word balance. It's exactly what it is, because otherwise you become too wedded to the real, and if the people then become too real, you say, well... They wouldn't do that, and I, I don't. I feel bad about them. I mean, they're they're dead a hundred years, and you still feel like you want to do them justice. So try to just get that flavor of it, because yes. that's the difference between a book that you can't put down and one that you put down as soon as you pick it up. You never pick it up again. It can be the difference. It can be a difference that's stark because. Here you're spending this time reading those newspapers. You're in the Coney Island Museum, the Museum of the City of New York, the Brooklyn Historical Society, other places. You're getting that all loaded in your head. You're getting excited. And because we're sitting across from each other here in the studio, I can see you light up. And you oh. can probably see me, too. I'm like <laughs> jumping out of my chair. And people at home hopefully hear that. And they, they decide they want to pick up Dreamland because it sounds so infectious. And they want to time travel back to 1911, too. But... When we were emailing in preparation for our interview, you said you, it's important to you to avoid a data dump. And you, do, you don't want to tell people there's things you need to know, maybe 90%. I know sometimes they say like mm -hmm. an iceberg, you know, mm -hmm. the reader only needs that little bit right. at the top. They don't need everything. They don't need, for instance, Peggy has that Coca-Cola. And they don't need to know about the bottle and the bottle cap. And you may well know that, but you didn't need to research exactly what the Coke bottle I mean, I was like. dying to tell everyone what was on the <laughs> label. <laughs> yeah, see? But, you know, Peggy wouldn't know things like, you know, right. cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> she yeah. wouldn't know. Like, <laughs> So that's the challenge is to just is to read a lot. And also, as as you saw in my author's note, I, I went to a lot of places. Tenement Museum also was a great place Oh, for yeah, me. Orchard Street. That's a oh, great spot. It was really amazing. People in this era. Yeah, and Coney Island itself, walking around, even though it's completely changed from the period in which I, I write about. But, I mean, just to breathe the same air and to get the geographical feeling of is it a bay <laughs> is it open how big would the waves be that doesn't change too much i think so i wanted to get all of that that sense of it you know i am a research hound and i had a a, a friend who wrote a very good suspense novel that involved two men breaking out of prison in upstate new york you know i'm very interested in because we had had a real case, you probably remember it, of some men who did break out of a prison with the help of a woman who worked at the prison and hid for a while and were recaptured. I just find it interesting, like, how do you get out of a prison? You know, that's one of my, my little, <laughs> like, not that I plan yeah, to have that say. challenge myself, <laughs> but, like, how do people, like, escape from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood? But so I asked her, like, your characters, how did they break out? And she says, oh, I'm not like you, Nancy. I, 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 I didn't go into that. I just had them break out and show up. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Different choices. And it was a really good book and did very well. So her readers didn't care. But I just feel like I have to go the extra mile to try to find out things. 
like exactly where the train would have picked someone up to take them to Manhattan Beach. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that too. I was talking I about like the I maps. Had, yeah, the... I felt like I had to know. And, you know, it's not that hard to find out. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing with the internet now. <laughs> it's almost begging you. Oh. It, it's hard to say, no, I'm not going to click around for a map of the subway in 1911 because I know it's out there and I can mm-hmm. find it if I apply myself. And the next thing you know, an, an hour has gone by and you... Or you just know enough and you're disciplined enough to put it aside maybe and look at it later or frame it for the wall or something like that. I, I find when I'm researching it, I'll put it in a Word file and I'll say, well, I'll get back to that later at some point. And even if I never do, I'm, I'm at least tricking myself. No, and, I, I hear you. <laughs> I know there it does are not parts of, uh, parts of New York that are unchanged. The buildings, um, you know, the Flatiron Building, parts of the Upper East Side, parts of Wall Street, and the Morgan Library is an excellent way to time travel because they have preserved the study in the library that J.P. Morgan built as a temple of his idea of great culture. And his son made sure that it was preserved. So, you know, and that was ahead of the time. Because that's the problem with Coney Island is that we all wish that we could see some of those things. But, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, there wasn't that idea yet that maybe we should save some of this, Yeah, you know, for everybody to see. You know, so now there's this uh, wonderful... Uh, park which you mentioned the wonder wheel and you have like some really old time great things like grandma who tells fortunes if you put a quarter in there and gives you a card i saw you tweet about that yeah Yeah. i love grandma every time i go out there i put my money in but a lot of it is totally changed and of course the challenge now with coney island is that they need the people who are out there who own stores or own rides they need to make money and they need to get the young families in there And, you know, young families these days like water parks and things like that. So how do you balance modern day young families who really need a day with the kids with this rich, amazing history of Coney Island? Because Coney Island once was a worldwide phenomenon. I mean, Sigmund Freud. Also in the book. I had to do. I couldn't resist. He came to see it. (laughs) See, she's not perfect. Sometimes you can't resist. Here's the thing, And yet you did it well. You did that part. (laughs) That was great. Well, but here's an example of how I have to restrain myself because... He never did tell anyone that we know of what he thought of Coney Island. But he wasn't a big fan of America. And he did say in either a paper or an interview afterward, America is a mistake. (laughs) And I kind of wanted to put that in there, but I couldn't find a natural place. And so (laughs) even though I wanted Sigmund Freud to say America and maybe even Coney Island are a mistake, I just couldn't find. So I had to leave it out, even though I thought it was pretty funny. You know, and there's (laughs) things like, you know, uh, Henry Ford met Thomas Edison at the Oriental Hotel where Peggy stayed. But there wasn't yeah, a natural. way for me to naturally yeah. work it in. So I know it when I'm writing it that presidents and inventors and uh, really famous people. Which I think you mentioned it that way. Yeah, in yeah. I And I would like to, because people love to get the, I don't want to say trivia, but they like to get the little facts that, you know, they didn't know before that enrich it. But I don't want to put them in just because I know them. <laughs> yeah. They have to like, serve the story of the character. So it's hard. And and what I, one way, though, I do get it in there is that I also write a lot of nonfiction. I do a lot of blogging. So sometimes with my books afterward, I'll share stuff. NancyBillU.com? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I'll share. Uh, like I did a big article about the Oriental Hotel and the uh, Manhattan Beach Hotel, which were built by the same man. It's in my book, but it's not a huge thing. But he was actually very racist and anti-Semitic. And blacks and Jews were banned from those hotels, absolutely banned. And after he died, the hotels all changed. And, you know, that bothers me quite a bit. And so I wrote about it in a blog. But I can't, I don't feel it's right to stop everything and give a historical lecture in a novel if it's not organic. So so it's a balance, but it is important to me. Part of this book is about class and people feeling that they can't always do what they want to do with their lives. And in moment to moment, they can't go where they want to go, you know? Yeah, you always have to worry about everyone else and what they're thinking, which I did a little bit earlier. So imagine that impulse that I had 
all the time. Yeah. What do I wear? What do I, I can't even draw my own bath because the maid's going to get mad. <laughs> I would think I'm identifying with the maid, right? And I'm thinking, well, good. I come in and you've already dressed yourself and made yourself a bath at 20 years old. I can right. go play backgabbing. Or when she tells the one young man, you mentioned croquet, they're playing croquet mm-hmm. and he's all worried because she says she doesn't want to play anymore and he's afraid he's done something wrong. Can you please tell them I didn't? And that, I wanted those, to get yeah, in Those there. are all in it that it, it's not just from the top down and they're all wanting to overthrow them. Although this is a thing with her bow, this boy she meets, this artist, this Serbian, he's come from a world of revolution where you're going to throw those rich people out of the carriages and you're mm-hmm. going to maybe pull a Franz Ferdinand type heist or assassination. You know, this, and this is what the police are worried about with him. This is all baked into the book. And I think... Even if you don't say those things, it's a great time to be an author because we can go to nancyblueu.com. We can follow you on Tutor Scribe and see your Twitter feed. And you have an outlet, that little file that I took, talked about, right? You <laughs> right. can you can say, well, I'll tweet that out or I'll, I'll send that out at some point. I'll write a blog post on it and I can still share with people who are those readers who want more. Because not every reader does, or they might not want the same thing. So you can't justify to yourself. I could see you working that big puzzle, right? You can't. Mm-hmm. I can't justify putting that in if it's not going to play to everybody. But I do have a place where if people are interested, or places they mm-hmm. can go to my Facebook. They can go to you have Instagram, which is also yeah. to describe your, yeah. your handle. So there's still so many places where you can learn more. And Peggy herself, even her background, because you do mention. They're Jewish, but they never spoke of it. They never go to synagogue. No, they, they're eating shellfish. They're yeah. just, they're not yeah. observant. And, you know, I did base that on some real families, although there were some families that were very observant and very religious. Not all of them were, you know, like with every faith. But one thing to get back to what you said that was really important to me was to show how somebody like Peggy would look at the police as opposed to somebody who's coming over from Europe who has encountered police in a different way, a different kind of police. Yeah, it's still very, very true. Yeah, think of it. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to do it without getting too crude. I never want to have snidely whiplash, like really mean people. I always want to try and get into anybody's perspective, although it's very hard to get into the perspective of a cop who would be the suspect. <laughs> you know, I, That's not really a headspace I want to be in. <laughs> that was definitely going on in the interrogation rooms and that period. So I wanted to, and yet yet other police, and there's a character in the book who becomes more and more important as he goes along, uh, who's passionate about justice and about finding uh, someone who's done some horrible crimes. I just try not to stereotype, but I do have to show how some people acted. There was a lot of bribing and there was a lot of payoffs of journalists too to keep things out of the paper. Yeah, and they were trying to capture that nickel. So, hey. (laughs) Everybody wants the nickel. (laughs) I've mentioned many times before when I talked with Charles Learson about his book, Mm. Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty. Mm. And he went into it thinking, okay, I'm going to find news stories about what a horrible racist Ty Cobb was. And he ends up finding out that these stories are made up out of whole cloth by this yellow journalist named Al Stump. Oh, wow. And he was for integration, for instance, of the major leagues. And they said, oh, didn't he pistol whip and murder a black guy and... He said, Charles Learson, I knew it wasn't from reading the papers because for one thing, if it was a person that was black that beat somebody up, it wouldn't just say man murdered. It would Mm -hmm. say Negro murdered and it would use all kinds of horrible epithets and and racial slurs that we think of from back then because that made it more more menacing, more attractive mm, wow. to readers. And yeah. so that that struck me as with her. She's they're almost boldly saying, Hey, give us the shellfish. See here, eating lobster, not not Jewish, not that Jewish. <laughs> we're we're going native. And that's okay to some extent, but then they fall down a rabbit hole of their own for all that money. But we're mm-hmm. right next to Carnegie Hall here, another family. That right. that could have been the Batternbergs, right? Hey, let's right. go. Like you said, JP Morgan and Guggenheim and any of the bad things we did, let's make sure posterity only knows us for our really good work. So hey, that oh that guy, that guy, the guy who made the well, big music hall. And it's like Rockefeller Center. Yeah. Which another one. Everybody knows about. Yeah. It was built by John Rockefeller's son as sort of a, a, a very vigorous effort to redeem the family's name because John D. Rockefeller had become the most hated man in America and the government was going after him hard, breaking up his oil empire, and the whole family was all hands on deck. We've got to redeem ourselves. We need some good PR. (laughs) Now we have Rockefeller Center (laughs) with the Christmas tree. And, you know, I would say that probably 99% of the people who go to see that Christmas tree have no idea that the Rockefellers were once a hated family. 
But, you know, that's what's so interesting about New York, whether it's the Rockefellers, J.P. Morgan, Carnegie, Frick. A lot of them uh, contributed amazing cultural institutions to New York. But they came (laughs) to that juncture, not totally cynically, but there was some effort there to, um, you know, change what the public thought of them. (laughs) Let's put it that way. Because... Um, and I know there's one thing that I didn't know much about until I wrote this book is that there was a lot of tension right before World War One between the government and the muckrakers. That's what they call them, the investigative reporters. And on the other side, the wealthy who were feeling very besieged and very hounded and unappreciated. But the other side had a point. A small group of people were really running America. I mean, J.P. Morgan was more important than most presidents. Hey, he wrote a check to the U.S. Treasury. Yes. He being able to do that. I know. I mean, like when Theodore <laughs> Roosevelt, who coins that term, muckraker, he calls him in and he says, well, why don't you just have my man talk to your man, Roosevelt? And, he, and by, by your man, he means the Secretary of State you know, of, know. The, of the United States. And his man is his lawyer or whatever. To him, he was he was equal. Why wouldn't why wouldn't I be? I helped before I bailed out the U.S. government. That's a lot of power, and we just that had, is too much you know, power. And that was what people were starting to think. Yeah, seeing at the time of my book was people were starting to think there's too much power in the hands of the totally un, you know, monitored, regulated, yeah. <laughs> unregulated to say the least, wealthy. On the other hand, in 1907, the country came very close to. I mean, it wasn't a panic. It could have been a 1929 meltdown. And we didn't have the Federal Reserve, and we didn't have a strong banking system. And what J.P. Morgan did was he had some people come over to his library, and he put them in a room and said, you're going to come up with a list of businesses that we can save, businesses we're going to let fail. And we're going to then put money in the ones we're going to save, and we're going to keep the economy from crashing. And then he locked the door and went and played solitaire in another part of the library and said, you're not coming out (laughs) until you have the list. So it's kind of crazy and presumptuous and arrogant. But at the same time, it did prevent a 1929 meltdown. So, you know, you have mixed feelings looking back on that period, because in J.P. Morgan's head, he was dedicated to America and he was saving America. But then toward the end of his life, he was persecuted by the government for his arrogance. So imagine what somebody like that would do. You know, it couldn't happen now. You wouldn't have that much power. Yeah, I hadn't even had an income tax yet. No. So he, that, was all, <laughs> that was all his gravy, and he felt yeah. that it was for the benefit of the country. Why would you need all these little businesses? Gosh, competition is so messy. Capitalism is so messy. If I just own all of the ice <laughs> and all of the oil, think how cheaply I'll be get, able to get you coal yeah, and simple. oil, and it, <laughs> why not? It'll be, it'll be better for the consumer because, of course, once we're the only game in town, we're going to sell things reasonably, right. but it just made people really uncomfortable and made them really suffer. And then you have someone here like Peggy, who you're coming from this long lineage. If old Pierre back there was mm. a real horrible fellow, and yet you were incredibly rich and you'd gotten rich off the things he was doing, maybe you don't want to be digging into ancestry. But, right. but if you were like Peggy, you're curious. So you want to know the right. truth. Right. And that's what she does. That's that's part of the mystery of Dreamland. Right. Right, what she's going to do with that impulse. You're enjoying my conversation with Nancy Billu, and I'm enjoying it too. We're having a great time here. It's <laughs> yes. so nice to sit down. The, the interviews in person always have a different flavor to them. We're talking about her novel, Dreamland. You can find her at nancybillu.com, on Twitter and Instagram at tutorscribe, or facebook.com slash author. Her last name is spelled differently from that ancestor, Pierre. I think it's a letter off. B-I-L-Y-E-A-U. Publishers Weekly writes of Dreamland, quote, Bilyeu populates her story with achingly believable, realistically flawed characters. Peggy is naive and far from perfect, but her heart is in the right place, and one can't help feeling for her predicament. This fascinating portrait of the end of the Gilded Age deserves a wider audience. Nancy, I like that idea, but it gives me a little pang of sadness when I hear that the Gilded Age, with all these, we're talking about all this gold that was uh, just the gilding, right? Covering some bad things inside. Yes. It's romantic for us, and yet, hopefully, as modern people, we, we do feel that pull to remember that it was not everybody pulling up at once. And even though you had people like 
the staff, like the maids and the boys there at the hotel, the Oriental Hotel, long since gone, by the way, gone in mm-hmm. 1916. That's all stripped away. And so we want to be able to remember it and remember what they went through. Your whole book is told from Peggy's point of view, at least, as I mm-hmm. said, I've only mm-hmm. gotten 75% through. Uh, so I don't uh, think you suddenly bring no. in an, an That would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> that would be author jail. No. But in the beginning, you do have your prologue, which is from another point of view. Mm -hmm. It's a man and a woman walking down the beach, but only the man returns alive. I think we hear Mm -hmm. a little bloop there, right, of the Mm -hmm. the lady, presumably her Mm -hmm. body, going into the water. Dropping a body is a great way to start a book. (laughs) And you start with the line that you invoked before about all of those lights and about the the city that is Coney Island, this magical Mm -hmm. place going to sleep. The first line is, the Phantom City vanished an hour after midnight. Now, you talked about being an editor. You talked about capturing people's opinions, all these these things about how being an editor helped you hone your craft and your mm-hmm. skill. How important is that first line to you? Because I feel oh, people feel oh, different levels. Yeah, I <laughs> work over my leads, as they call them in uh, journalism. I And in a novel, it would be your opener. I labor over them endlessly to the point where I can't even read it anymore. It's memorized. I can't even, and then I have to put it away for a few days because I can't see it fresh anymore. <laughs> you start to look at the word and go, wait a minute. Is that really how the is spelled? I know, exactly. Phantom. Phantom looks weird. Is yeah. that how you spell phantom? Huh? Yeah. It gets crazy in your head. What I tried to do in that very beginning was something that is close to my heart, immersion. I am trying to put you, the reader, into a time and a place that's different from where you are now. And I do it through what you see, what you smell, what you hear, and sometimes what you taste. So you can't do that through a whole book. It would just be too laborious and intense. But I do like to have sort of jolts of it throughout the book. And in the beginning, I wanted to do it. Okay, Coney Island, 1911. Here it is. <laughs> so it's almost like, and do you want to stay? I hope you do. <laughs> that's that's what I'm trying to um I do. Create. Yeah. <laughs> with that opener. There's something you said about putting us in that period. I like to ask about slang and jargon because that's something that an mm-hmm. author can use to give you a real flavor for the age you're visiting. Right. But those are like spices is the way author Amber Brock described it to me. Mm-hmm. We talked about her novel, Lady Be Good. And I thought as a cook myself, having having written a cookbook, I thought huh? that's perfect because too much mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is going to ruin it and too mm-hmm. little. Wait, I don't taste anything in there. And you can't keep going back into the book. Well, you can when you edit, right? And right. see what tastes right and what, what tastes too strong and where you don't taste that or you'll ruin the meal. And so in Dreamland, I noticed – your characters don't pepper their dialogue with a ton of the period no. language. You're, you're very sparing in the way that you use that. And, hey, I mentioned before, this is a good callback about how I like things that are that are plain when I'm eating them. I want to taste the mm-hmm. chicken. I want to mm-hmm. taste the mm-hmm. meat. I don't need something with a ton of sauce or a big, big, huge bowl of soup. I'm, I'm anti-soup. People that know me <laughs> make fun of me for <laughs> being against soup. Also, also My I'm, daughter hates soup, too. I'm, oh, uh, good. You know, she's in soup, soup haters <laughs> unite. It's an election year. We should start a pack. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Here you are. You're you're finding a voice for Peggy. It would be easy to lean on things like jargon. It would be easy to lean on something like a date at the top, a hammer way to say, okay, you're in 1911 now, and have that do the lifting mm-hmm. for you mm-hmm. instead of you having to do it as the author. And then you have Stefan, this artist who's getting to know Peggy, and you have to remember that Okay, when you first meet somebody and you you like somebody, you're not speaking a whole lot, right? You usually mm-hmm. and you're speaking a little different. You're holding back. You're you're getting to know the person. Mm-hmm. She's just buying his paintings. She likes his art. So you only have a few words there to work with. And English is not his first language. I don't even think it's his second. He speaks a no, little bit of a bunch yeah, of languages, Italian right? And, yeah, Italian and his own uh, Serbian language. So how do you go about that? How do you decide how you're going to flavor their dialogue so it doesn't come across like a cliche? Well, I just. It's a personal bias of mine that when there are words from another time peppered in there in historical fiction, when I'm reading, and I read my own genre a lot for pleasure, it often takes me out of it. You know, it takes me out of the story just a little. And that's why I don't do much of it. Now, I'm very careful not to have modern words in there. And I really go through there and almost fact check. Like the word slumming, you know, that actually did that was Exist, said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think it did. I was happy <laughs> because it was important in the context. But it does a lot of heavy lifting. Yes, work, yes, work. yeah, in many, many contexts. But 
that's why I, it's just a personal bias of mine because when I'm reading a book and, you know, like people love Patrick O'Brien and his nautical books, but I find that there's so many terms in there from the period and so much about the terms of the boat that I can't get into the story because I'm, I'm just sort of making my way through here, you know, and I often have to open up the uh, internet dictionary and for oh, some people that's, less. yeah, for some people that is wonderful. But I don't want to ever make you stop and feel like you're out of the story a little bit. It's the same reason that I, I try not to put too many exciting facts in if I don't think that they serve the story. Because I just want you to be carried along. And I don't know if you'll be carried along if you're having a lot of 1911 slang in there that you might not know what it means. Although often in context, you can kind of get it. You know, what I did, too, was I like to read some fiction that was written at the time. So I read huh. some Edith Wharton and some other writers who came out with books then. There's a Ford Maddox Ford that I wrote. And so I looked through their dialogue. And, you know, there weren't that many words. That, you know, it's funny. I, I think that now when you read a book that has a lot of dialogue from another time, I think the writer had to work a little to get all these words. And then it's almost like, okay, and here they come. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, use your research. You do those yeah. websites that have slang from 1917. And, and then you might miss something like, for, I always say zipper. Zipper is kind of a big demarcation point right. for me because, right. you know, or like a wristwatch is a little more mm -hmm. obvious. I think people know more mm -hmm. now from the Great War with all the movies that people started wearing their wristwatch then. But if you're reading and you say, well, wait a minute, that's not something that would be there. You'll put the book down. And if you're a history minded person, you probably are if you read historical fiction. And I find it interesting right. that you've made that transition. No, from... it's a it's a real deliberate choice. I mean, I'm a huge admirer of F. Scott Fitzgerald. If you read his novels, there's not that many words in there that aren't used now. So I think that's interesting. How would he know yeah, right. well, <laughs> what, what a slang word was then that would not be used now? It's interesting yeah. to me. Which makes me wonder if 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 you were to hear people talking now verbatim something from 1911 maybe i have a feeling you would understand everything you know there wouldn't be that much because yeah, we don't use slang all the time either no. when you think about it you're not constantly using it and what do we even say now so you don't know when you're in the moment oh my daughter you know is always correcting me like i said something was hip she says no one says that <laughs> no one you know that's a modern word from your perspective <laughs> i know me, right well, it was yeah. permissible <laughs> i was wrong one of my favorite ways that an author used dialogue was Martin Fletcher. He's a longtime journalist. He was the Tel Aviv bureau chief, and he writes mm. a book, Promised Land, is the first novel of his three-part series. Here, all these people are coming after the Holocaust to the newly found Jewish state, and they're trying to become a country, basically. They don't mm -hmm. all speak the same language. The ones who came from Germany are looking down on the ones, for instance, from Egypt or from other places. And from America, the one guy comes, and one brother, there's these two brothers who are the only survivors of their family. And so one of them is a businessman and he goes in and he's going to meet with the minister of whatever for Israel. And he starts using all these Yiddish terms because he wants to show that he's really part of, of Israel. The other character then says, maybe, maybe lay off the so much Yiddish <laughs> like he notices. And so when I when I spoke to Martin Flesher, I said, I just thought that was so great because it wasn't as if your hand was tipped. I didn't feel like that's the author winking at me mm -hmm, because he mm -hmm. doesn't know I'm going to be speaking to him. But I just thought. What a great way to solve that problem. You're getting the Yiddish out of the way. Yeah, that's very saying, clever. Yeah, and then you're saying, well, this is why I didn't use it. You know, you're too, Jackie Mason has that bit. Well, too Jewish. I don't like him. He's too, that, that's, <laughs> that one is too Jewish. You know? And this is, that's part of the American experience, too, that you talk about here with the Batternbergs and with Peggy, where you think we want to be Americanized. We want to be in, in this new world, want to mm -hmm. be in America's playground. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be looked at differently. We want to come here. And you mentioned the Tenement yes. Museum. Mm -hmm. And down there is the synagogue. It's the first synagogue mm -hmm. in America, right? It's now in the middle of Chinatown. And they said when they tried to rebuild the synagogue, there are pigeons living in it. It was just a mess. Eldridge Street is what it's on. They found an old list and they figured if we called them, they'll want to come. They'll want to donate. They'll want to help. We'll have hordes of people. And people weren't interested. Mm -hmm. And one man said to them, I spent the first 40 years of my life trying to get off the Lower East Side, and now you want me to come back. <laughs> and so that's great. You put your mind in it and say, there you are. It's different for us. They were moving on with their life. They didn't know it was historic. It was just their day. They weren't worried about saving those great old hotels and the things we wish they would have. And that's, I think, something here in Dreamland that because you write that way with that consciousness, I don't feel 
they're wandering around staring. We don't do that in our lives. And as an author, it's easy to say, well, here, look at my research. I want you to really, we use the time machine reference a bunch of times or metaphor. And hey, in our lives, we didn't stand around and just stare at the World Trade Center, right? Right, right. We wish we did now, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. Just especially if you're in New York, it was a point of pride, right? You never go to these places because you live here and you can go anytime, maybe if a tourist comes to town. And so I like that, the speed in which you keep the book going. And we don't feel like we're reading a novel. We feel like she's telling us a story. I'd like to ask authors to read a section for listeners because that gives us a flavor for your writing and what you choose. This is something that you appreciate as a novelist, right? What, what someone says when they enter a room is very important. Also something they say when a comedian goes on stage, right? Don't say, how are you doing, ladies and gentlemen? Because this is your first <laughs> moment. This is your, that's such a wasted opportunity. Uh, I think it might be Steve Martin who says that. That's a wasted opportunity. Or Seinfeld or maybe Eddie Murphy in, in one of those episodes of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Mm. But there's a million things to do when you walk in a room. So what you choose tells me and will tell listeners something. So I have a copy of Dreamland right here. People can hear it. Are you flipping <laughs> through it? I like to just start at the beginning because... You don't need to have read any part of it. I don't have to summarize and say, ah, the story thus far, you know, which is always kind of hard. The Phantom City vanished an hour after midnight. The one million lights of Dreamland darkened as they always did, the clang as loud as a cannon shot, followed by a long, wheezing gush. The rides, the attractions, the sideshows, the restaurants, the dance hall, the entire 15-acre fairground stretching from the canals of Venice to Lilliput, all of it had been shut down for the night. Once they'd thrown the switch on the light panels, it didn't take long for the heat created by the electric bulbs to dissipate, replaced by the cool, salt-flavored ocean breeze. But the smell of the fairground hung on. Nothing could drive away the scent of stale popcorn, roasted peanuts, taffy and cotton candy, fried crab boiled corn and beer, mingling with the odor of greasy machinery and rank human sweat. That was the fragrance of Coney Island, and no one ever forgot it. The customers trudged home, and the exhausted park workers stumbled to the narrow beds in their apartment houses in Brooklyn. It was dark and still on the fairgrounds. This was the time when the night policeman made his rounds. The beach was on his left, and Dreamland on his right. The seagulls, his only companions, hopped in the sand. Then, in the moonlight, past the bathing pavilions, he saw the two human figures halfway down the beach, walking slowly toward the water's edge. It was a silhouette of a man, his arm around the waist of a woman wearing a long, dark dress, that in the moonlight stood out against the white sand. The policeman smiled to himself as the couple sank into the sand. Hadn't he courted his wife the same way? That was twenty years ago, and he still looked forward to coming home, taking off his uniform, and sliding into bed next to her as she slept, the springs creaking as he kissed her soft shoulder. The policeman kept walking, headed toward Luna Park, where Shoot the Shoots and Helter Skelter were rendered motionless until morning. He didn't hear the woman in the sand, a sharp, startled cry. <gasps> a few minutes later, there was a different noise, a splash in the water. No one saw the man walk up the beach and onto the promenade, alone. So that has to make people want to read more. What happened to this lady? What happened? She people just are wishing. Get a uh, people are wishing this was the audio book now, so they could keep going. And, <sighs> but 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 this is a good author, so she knows you don't tell people right away what happens and what's happening or who no. that man was. I want to know well, already. I've already yeah. I've already read a bunch. When you you talked about Peggy there a little bit about her last name or and about her family name rather. Mm -hmm. She goes into the police station and she thinks how it's hot as hell. It feels like hell there. And then one of the policemen is named Sean Devlin. And I wondered if that was purposeful <laughs> on your part, that you gave him a name that's almost devil or not. I have a friend from elementary school who, like me, has Irish-American background whose last name is Devlin. <laughs> so it was an homage <laughs> to her. And Sean is just a, a man's name I like. Now, of course... And I am giving this away. He's not like the nicest person in the world. But I gave him a very nice name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd see, I read that in. It's always great when you think of that. Well, that's really clever. And it's nice yeah, of you the to devil. agree to answer this question and not tell me not to ask it. Because I wish <laughs> no, I could take credit. I wish I, I wish I, you know, could have it be the, the theme could be so, yeah. so brilliant there. I just love using uh, old friends' names when I can. There's another lovely moment in your book that, 
clearly is crafted for effect, even if people just have it passed over, if they're not reading it, looking for those pencil lines. It's a line by Peggy after she's gone and she's gathered a bunch of wildflowers and then she has to go and sit in with her family and she goes to pick them up as she leaves and she says, just a half hour or so in the parlor had turned my daisies limp and shriveled. And I just thought that was such a beautiful metaphor for her. Here she's out living her life. She's at the bookstore. She's being independent. Then her rich uncle comes, drags her out of there, and she's in a meeting with this, this author and, and publisher, I believe. And and mm-hmm. th- that's not directly when this happens, but it's she's out trying to be herself, especially when she's in Dreamland and meets Stefan, and she doesn't want to say who she is, and she's so happy that he doesn't know her name when she finally says Oh, I know. That's Batternburg, a great moment right? for her. Yeah. He's like, doesn't even react. Yeah. She's like, oh. <laughs> you get to become, you get to be yourself. You're not defined mm-hmm. anymore by who your family is and how much money you have. She's so happy. And so I just thought that was a wonderful little moment because in this era, any woman, but especially this particular character that you create, your spirit is being crushed. It's being really held in. Think about the corset, right? Think about mm-hmm. the shirtwaists in, in the old days, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, places oh. like that. They were. That's why Shirtwaist Factory was there, and that's actually why there was that tragedy. They started locking the doors. They Women started moving away from shirtwaists eventually, and so, hey, you've got to make more. We've got to be more efficient and cut down on things like stealing and always suspecting those girls. And unfortunately, there was those tragic deaths there at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. But She's really being crushed and people are wilting in general. She's mm-hmm. not thriving. She's been picked and she's been been dropped on a table, not put in water. And so that's that's something that comes across in the book without, as you said, you stopping and saying, look how horrible this society was compared to <laughs> how enlightened we are today. Right. Like you, you don't take us out of the moment. This is her world. And we I'm sure people will look back in 100 years and say, oh, those poor people had to deal with what we had to deal with. But you do it in such a way that, as I said, she's a, she's a fish that doesn't know she's wet. She's learning that maybe there's a mm-hmm. castle around somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, she wants to get out of the castle, I guess, in the fishbowl. That I didn't really think out that metaphor, but. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, but it's that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Where you, she's no, learning a new, hey, I can walk on land. Like, uh, hey, there you go, Little Mermaid. That's a perfect one. Or in Splash, mm-hmm. where I can get legs. I can see the world outside of the ocean, this world I've lived in. In fact, she's a princess under the water, right, Ariel, in, in The Little Mermaid. And here, She's going on land where she's just like anybody else and can learn to dance, which she could never do underwater. And that's actually another thing here with Peggy. She does dance. It's just such a universal feel. Yeah, it's such no, a universal feeling of where you want you want to be able to go and kick off your shoes as she does. You mentioned the bathing suit before. Mm-hmm. She has to, there's a great moment with the bathing suit, just as there is when we know what Coca-Cola was back then. And she has it. And, oh, gosh, it makes me feel so great. And then later, <laughs> she just thrills in telling her family, I would like a Coca-Cola. Well, she's out with her sister and a couple yeah. of her sister's friends. And yeah. they're saying, oh, my gosh, Peggy, you don't drink Coca-Cola. No, no we're all We're having lady, tea. Yeah, you're not right. Coca-Cola. So it's it's just all those moments are just so wonderful throughout the book. And I hope people will pick up Dreamland because you get to experience it if you like anything about that era or even just want to look at this era a little bit differently. And what are we swimming in right now that we don't realize? You get it through her. And that's not even your goal. Your goal is to tell a great story, right? And you still do that for us. But I did feel when I did my research that there was a lot of tension and pushback against women during this period because, you know, they were starting to ask for the vote and they were starting to really try to get into the workforce. There was a lot of tension, and that is an underlying thing in the book, although I rarely come out and talk about it. But, you know, I mean, to me, just the little things, like one of the uh, fashion trends then was something called the hobble skirt. Now, your skirt would be so narrow. Sounds great, right? Yeah, that you (laughs) you couldn't. You could barely walk. Yeah. You definitely couldn't boardwalk. run. On the boardwalk yeah. or in the sand. Yes. So, and I wonder, like, whose idea was it to keep women so that they were just barely able to move in these skirts that were tied so tight down by their their calves? You know, just little things like that. And I just wonder, is it a total coincidence that somebody uh, decided a trend would be uh, putting women in skirts in which they can't really walk? <laughs> Right when they're pushing to be able to run. You know what I mean? So I try to just sort of subtly work it in, you know, uh, these moments when there's an opportunity. Especially if you can't run when we're talking here about somebody who's obviously grabbing women down on the beach. And Oh, yeah. Well, there, <laughs> yes, there is crime. 
or the yeah. wasp waist and all the, the yes. Gibson girls back then. Women, especially this, you're talking 1911, this hot, hot summer. You want to be wearing as little as you can. You don't want to be in the even in the ocean in a wool bathing suit. Or Those wool... bathing suits oh. uh, weighed 10 pounds. <laughs> when they're wet? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, it showed nothing. Um, yeah. There was a lot. Well, of... it gave you no comfort. Never mind showing nothing, which okay. Right. But it, it they were gave uncomfortable. You, how much of a relief are you going to get going into the water when you're no. wearing wool? For no. Crying out loud. And and one thing about Peggy's life, which was uh, historically accurate, was that um, there was a lot of pressure on women from wealthy families not to go to college because it would make you less feminine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Something with uh, ten. Well, it wouldn't have been ten years before, but ten years before was when. William McKinley was assassinated, but uh, and they blamed Emma Goldman initially. In fact, the word you were talking about words, you were mm-hmm. surprised to find mm-hmm. the word slumming. Yes, yeah. You said you were surprised to find that word uh, used back then. Terrorism was also used in 1901, which you never would think would be right. Used, I know but they used it. Her father tells her, "Why do you need to be reading? A Jewish wife doesn't have to learn to read. Meanwhile, she has no interest in being a wife. But okay, all you need to do is get married, have babies, and learn to cut the gefilte." the noodles you know mm-hmm. and she's like oh that's not what i want for my life and so why everyone else is happy that way yeah why don't you fit in this little i'm gonna jam you into this little square hole you round peg you <laughs> so exactly. and here you have what is your character's name i said round peg into a square hole ah, there you go she's named very peg. very I, good i analyze his name <laughs> no right? that can't be an accident <laughs> so, yeah that's subconscious when i read dreamland i could almost see your pen veering physically away like those light cycles in tron I watched a documentary on Tron a couple weeks ago. I've seen Tron. But yeah, sure. (laughs) So you go at at a right angle, I found, whenever you came near a cliche. And as someone who reads a lot about the period and know more, I guess, than the average reader bear about what went on back then. But also, hey, we've all seen sitcoms. We've all seen romantic comedies. When you have this relationship of here's the heiress, here's the poor, starving, brooding artist, it's so easy to have a cliche in that relationship. And people may feel... Oh, this dreamland sounds like a book that I read before. That relationship sounds very familiar. And you you have this wide gulf where, yes, it's a, it's a universal human story. But I felt that whenever you came close to a cliche in their relationship, you turned at a right angle. You almost seem to be re- repelled from it and recognize it. You read a lot of novels outside what you're writing. You mm-hmm, read a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of various fiction. Did that help you? Is that instinctual? You're looking at me a little confused. I'm thinking no, maybe no, it's just no. I just realized I, no one's ever said that before. And I think <laughs> you're right that I I probably have read so much fiction. I mean, I started reading historical fiction when I was like ten or eleven years old, and I'm just determined to not feed into the stereotypes of, uh, you know, for instance. The verging on plain girl that nobody else knows is beautiful except for, you know, the dark, mysterious, arrogant stranger who's cruel to everybody except for her because (laughs) she sees the wounded beast within. You know, that's a trope that you could just find so often. And I just don't even know if it's even in life at all, really. They feel real. And that's a high compliment. That's what you're clearly going for. And you do it in Dreamland where you have people and you say, yeah, that's true. That's how people really react. Like when you watch a TV show or you read a novel, nothing takes you out of it faster than going, well, come on already. Like quicksand. Remember in the 70s, right. everyone was constantly falling in quicksand. Everybody was handcuffing that's themselves true. together. <laughs> why? Throw me the branch. Yeah. Well, why would, <laughs> like, really, Marsha? You were going <sighs> to handcuff yourself to Jan right when you knew you had to go to the prom? <sighs> I mean, and that's not a, a serious book, but it, it, it as, an, as an adult now, I guess right. we... We expect more from our fiction, whatever it is. We expect you to say, how come nobody ever wires a bomb with just white wires? Why do they? And how do you know which wire he used? I mean, I do a lot of my own home restoration stuff. Like I, maybe sometimes I use a different color wire if I didn't want anyone to be right. able to diffuse it. But it ratchets up the tension. And I think if I was writing a script for a TV show, I would do that just because I've seen it. A million times. We all have. And in this, I've you've seen a million times. Oh, he's an artist. And it would have been so easy for you to give him this thick accent and really broken English and really right, have him be right. just look, you know, paint a big sign over him, you know, call him Luigi Farnick man or yeah. something, you know. But instead, that that's what makes them feel real because we all know people in our lives. We meet the heiress. We meet the artist. And the person mm-hmm. is different. We meet the person from a vague 
Slavic country or in this case, Baltic country. And we don't exactly know where that is because maybe we don't have expectations or we lump them in somewhere else. They surprise us. And all of your characters in this book, you let them surprise us where we're, we don't feel like, oh, right. I know, I know this character, which is not the same as saying, I know this person. If you know this person, then they're, then they're very vivid to you. And I think your characters all are. But if you say, I know this character, I think it's a pretty big flashing light that eh, maybe I've read this before. I know what she's going to do. I never knew exactly what Peggy was going to do. Cause oh, you, good. you know, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I did want to avoid cliches. And in fact, in making him Serbian right off the bat, there are not that many Serbian characters in yeah, American no novels. And, you know, a lot of people who write about people at the turn of the century in New York would make him Italian. Yeah, and, I expected he would be. I was kind of rooting for him to be Greek, but I'll, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> but that tells you I'm identifying with him, right? <laughs> I wanted him to be, you know. Well, I worked with a woman who is Macedonian, and I got to like her, and she's a very interesting person. And it made me feel like it would be really cool to have a character who's from that part of the world, especially since we know what's going to happen in just a few years. Right. The whole world will change because of an action in the Balkans. So sometimes I just want to take opportunities to do characters who I've been wanting to do for a while. You know what I mean? It's like, God, I've been wanting to write a Serbian. <laughs> I've been wanting to <laughs> write a Huguenot in an earlier book. The heroine is a Huguenot. And so it's exciting when I can use some of that interest, you know, to infuse a, a character in a book. So to, and I'm not just doing it just to make them different, but usually because I've been wanting to do this and now this Keeps is you it. you interested. This right? is, yeah. I mean, you have to be interested too. Yeah, this gonna, is my time. Show through, yeah. 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 And that you said about like the hot dog eating contest, you know, you could just go watch them eat the hot dogs. But if you <laughs> are aware a little of the history, I think this, especially in fact, that there's a big historical part of it because I've been there. One of my wife's cousins, he's a judge, the equivalent of our state judge, mm. uh, state Supreme Court mm -hmm. in Canada. His wife is a CEO. They asked her to come judge the hot dog eating contest. And so she oh, said, my just... husband's a real judge. It'd be hilarious <laughs> to come down. <laughs> and uh, then I, I got the press pass. I went in the back. It was great. I had the little Japanese lady who competes with the women and kept saying, feel my stomach, which was a little strange because I was <laughs> wow. like, where do you put those, wow. you know? But anyway, yeah. uh, in the back behind them, they have all the dates, right, of the hot dog eating, right? The, mm -hmm. the champions mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. years. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Let me learn a little more. I think this is great. They should be selling this there at the hot dog eating contest just because you can't go to Coney Island without wanting to learn more about it. If you're of any kind of historical bent or any kind of a romantic, if you have a romantic bone in your body, it's a romantic place. It may have it really changed, is. but yeah. the romance has no, it is. stayed. I mean, even Nathan's has some surprises. I read that uh, one time a person was there in the 60s and he looked over and there was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis <laughs> At Nathan's, just like anybody else. <laughs> Who was expecting that? Nobody. <laughs> Speaking of historical preservation, there you go. Somebody played such a big role in it. Oh, and, uh, definitely. Fiona Davis here, who has a very nice quote here on the cover of Dreamland. Right. Beautifully written She's and impeccably amazing. researched. Yeah, she wrote I'm so a great book. For that. She wrote one on Grand Central. I interviewed her about her book. And about the, Grand, the Masterpiece. Of, yes. The Masterpiece yes. is her book and Grand yes. Central. So there you go. I mean, and then Jackie Kennedy Onassis plays a role in that. And so she I mean, raised she a lot of people's realize, awareness right? yeah. of the beauty and power of New York architecture. That we shouldn't just, you know, obliterate well, like you it. said, that's what they did in Coney Island, right? They knocked, oh, they so just much knocked of it, it down. We all still are, feel the pain of Penn Station, and we know the old oh. Penn Station was knocked down. Penn Station just gets worse and worse. <laughs> I was yeah. there like yesterday. I was like, "What's happening?" I don't know what they were thinking, but hey, I'm, like I said, I'm sure it's easy to condescend to the past, but they're not that far back. So right, I right. feel like we could still look down on them right. <laughs> or judge them or criticize them or whatever I'm go. doing. But I don't like that I walk through the town now showing I had some relatives here from Brighton Beach, not the Brighton Beach in Brooklyn, but from over in the UK. And I was wow. showing them so many places. And I, I said after, this is my used to be store. This hmm. used to be this bar. This used to be oh, this building. This wow. used to be and McHale's, remember, on Restaurant Row. And uh, Flaherty's was a great place on Restaurant Row. And you can end up, if you're not careful, down to just McSorley's and a few other mm. buildings that are not. Mm -hmm. At least the Hearst building, it, mm. they they built around that facade, right? Or they right. built inside it. They built that tower. Sort of so had to. Yeah, That's a least, beautiful yeah. interior in there. Yeah, then mm -hmm. it's an it's an attempt at least to respect her, even where the hippodrome was, mm -hmm. which is in this era. And you mm -hmm. you had that on Sixth Avenue in that bank there, it's sixth, forty eh, third and forty fourth, I think, or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a big mural in there. At least remember something of what was there before, because someday we're going to be in the past. It's nice to I think know. people will remember us, right? 
Well, people love to look at, I mean, there's amazing postcards and books devoted to, uh, you know, the Ouija photos, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, the black and white photos of New York. People love New York. But during the time of my book, there was a feeling that art cannot be of New York City. (laughs) New York City (laughs) is rough and primitive and and sort of embarrassing. Real art is of the classic, the old masters. And that was very strong. And that was something that the real Peggy Guggenheim fought against, you know, and celebrating modern art. But there wasn't any, even any sense of that in 1911, except for a very few people, you know, that anybody would want to have a photograph or a painting of a New York street. No one wanted that. I think of John Sloan. I mentioned Mick Sorley's and they call it the Ashcan School, right? Yes, and, you know, I that's love not, the that's not a romantic, no. not a, not a no. great name. It's not called the Golden Bucket School. No. It's called Ashcan. And he painted a portrait of McSorley's, a couple he has of McSorley's, but one is McSorley's cats. And he brings it into Bill McSorley and he shows him. It's him and all his cats. You can find it online. Or I think I posted it a bunch of times on Twitter at History Dean because I interviewed Rafe Bartholomew about his memoir, Two and Two, McSorley's My Dad and Me. He comes in, he shows him his painting of McSorley's, and he says to Bill, well, Bill says to him, rather, well, what do you get for a painting like this, John? And he tells him, and then Bill McSorley's all mad at him, and he was a surly guy anyway. And so they come over to him, and they say, well, what's he all mad at you about? He says, well, I told him what I get for one of my paintings, and he's mad at me because he thinks I'm lying and putting him on. And why would I lie to him? He's not stupid. He knows what art is. This isn't worth that. Like, I'm not. Just some, you know. And so today we salivate over those portraits. Oh, I know. And, you know, it's Ouija's totally photos changed. and stuff. Yeah. You know, the, that was another another book, another author that I'll plug, Chris Bonanos of New York Magazine. Mm. And he wrote Flash, Ouija. About, oh, about I, I Ouija. find Ouija really yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's like that, that was a whole different, and using new technology, too. I know. Even Coney Island closes down. I've kept you here, so <laughs> we learned that it closes down in the first line of our book. But we have time for one final question. Sure. I, as I mentioned, treasure my copy of your book, which I'm going to ask you to sign for me. But play Carnival Barker for us, because just like the way that you said there's all these various attractions, you, you have to really grab people sometimes physically to get them in there, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. offer them the bigger, better, louder, more mm-hmm. lights, more more fantastic things. So there's many books also on the shelf. I can tell people that I, I think that they should pick up Dreamland, but make your pitch as an author. Why should they take this trip into the past that you've crafted for them? Why should they get on that train? I just think that following Peggy, my main character, following her story, will have some rich moments, some surprises as you learn about another time. As you've mentioned in the interview, it'll bring to you moments that you might share. And so uh, a perspective that she has or another character has that might be something that would be recognizable to you. Oh, I've thought that. I've wondered that. And so I just think that that's what I try to do with my novels. I try to uh, immerse people in another time. But also I really want to make the characters as rich and as nuanced as possible. So I want you at the end to be like, oh, that was that had some surprises. That was suspenseful. That was interesting. But also... You know, it made me think a little bit about something in my life or something in the life of someone I care about. And that's what I really want to have as a reader's experience. Well, Nancy Bilyeu, author of Dreamland, <laughs> thank you for coming up town. Thank you for sure. calling an audible with me here at the last minute when we didn't oh, do that. Oh, it's my pleasure. But you're going to be doing that event hopefully in the fall yes. at Cluster yeah, Library. And they have a bunch of great authors there. So an abundance of caution, but we still got to sit down and speak. And that means I'll still get to share Dreamland with everybody in my audience on schedule, which I appreciate. I appreciate you oh, coming here my, and to meet me in the future. To talk about <laughs> talk about the past. I wish you the best of luck with the novel. I envy readers who are getting to meet Peggy for oh, the first time through, reading, through hearing you read the prologue. And I hope that they'll pick it up. At least go online, check out nancybillu.com. See this world that you've built in the real world that it came from. This was amazing. I really love talking to you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Dreaming of you, that's all I do. Night and day for you, I'm pining. Again, the novel is Dreamland. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com on the page for this episode. By buying books through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My sincere thanks to Nancy Bilyeu for joining me. 
You can find our guest at nancybillu.com, on Twitter and Instagram at the handle tutorscribe, or facebook.com slash nancybillyouauthor. That last name is spelled B-I-L-Y-E-A-U. And while you're online, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. We just finished uploading all of our archives, almost 200 interviews. You can subscribe to our iHeart channel, or you can subscribe to us on iTunes. And remember, if you are an iTunes subscriber, it really helps if you take a minute to leave a review. You don't even have to write anything, although that definitely is great. But you can give us a few stars. I have, I think, about 50 five-star reviews and just a couple of fours. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us to Coney Island today. And have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes.